Uh, my name is Trin Mai and on behalf of the Department for Education, I'm welcoming you to this session on the bullying of children with autism spectrum conditions presented by Neil Humphreys. Neil is a professor of psychology of education at the Manchester Institute of Education at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. Neil's research focuses on children's mental health, social emotional learning and special education needs and in particular uh, autism spectrum conditions. He is a world leader in inclusive education when we are absolutely thrilled to have him here. Now I know that there, we've also got some stellar speakers in the other uh, breakout sessions as well so please make sure that you check our video stream after the conference so that you don't miss out on a single speaker but I'm very very thrilled to welcome Neil. Please make him feel very welcome. Thank you very much, Trin. Good morning, everyone. Morning. What a wonderful, warm welcome um, I've had, and I think we've all had, those of us that are visiting Australia from other parts of the world. Um, we've all come a very long way, and it means a lot that we're made to feel so welcome, so thank you. Uh, so as Trin said, I'm Neil Humphrey. I'm the head of the Manchester Institute of Education. Just a quick show of hands if you've been to the UK and keep your hand raised if you've actually been to Manchester. A few of you, okay, I was expecting nobody. So you know, you know that Manchester is by far the best place in the UK. <laughs> I don't need to convince you of that, so we'll, we'll crack on. Okay. So I'm gonna to talk to you about um, bullying of children and young people with autism spectrum conditions. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what the research tells us about the extent to which uh, this group of young people are affected by bullying and victimisation and then really importantly uh, what we might be able to do uh, to help. My interest in this area comes from a range of kind of uh, influences. Uh, growing up, a uh, friend of the family had uh, a son who's a couple of years younger than me, younger or older? No, younger, uh, in, uh, who uh, was affected by autism and also complex learning difficulties. So. I was, as a child, at a, a point in time when, you know, nowadays people know about autism, you know, even children and young people know about the notion of autism. Uh, when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, it was, it was something that professionals may have heard about, but certainly children and young people didn't. So I'd, I kind of uh, knew a little bit about autism from that. And then as a young adult, was a, a volunteer for the National Autistic Society, which is our major autism uh, charity in the UK. Uh, and also did volunteer work for an organisation called PEACH, which is Parents for Early Intervention of Autism in Children, uh, doing early intensive behavioural support for children um, affected by autism. Uh, and then the work, the research on um, bullying comes from a much wider project or series of projects that we engage with, which was about inclusive education. So that notion of um, actively including children on the autism spectrum in mainstream uh, settings in the UK. So, before I begin, what I wanted to do is um, a little bit of a plug. So, uh, two doctoral students of mine, two very talented doctoral students of mine, uh, Emma and Ola, have developed uh, the MIE, Manchester Institute of Education, Building Evidence into Education, or B blog. So, the B, the worker B, is the symbol of the city of Manchester. So the B blog, the aim is to take the latest education research that we've been conducting, but also conducted by other people around the world, and translate it into a short, accessible format for busy professionals, people like yourselves, who might not have direct access to the latest research literature and certainly don't have the time to pore over it for hours and hours. So each B blog post um, can be read in you know five to ten minutes it's all been vetted to make sure that it's as accessible as possible and all of the posts are designed with kind of implications for practice in mind so it's it's about trying to do better what we currently don't do particularly well in the academy which is translate what we do um, so that it can change things at the chalk face you can sign up for the b it's completely free and it always will be you can sign up for the b in two ways one is um on the uh on the website, which is manchesterac.uk, M-I-E-B, or if you find them on Twitter, um, you can sign up and then you'll get the post, you'll get a notification whenever a new blog is posted. I think they're posted about twice a month or thereabouts. Also, just to say a little bit about autism research uh, in Manchester. So the 
bigger picture of autism research at Manchester is we have a, uh, an interdisciplinary network called Autism at Manchester, um, which covers every faculty in our university with the exception of engineering and physical sciences. So every other faculty at the university has at least one researcher who is doing something around autism which I think makes Manchester quite a special place in that regard. So we work together with people who are doing work on the genetics of autism, obviously our interest is in education, whole range of different disciplines and we come together routinely uh, and we have a website which you can have a look at our research and we use it as a portal for kind of recruitment for studies and so on. Obviously we have a, a strong connection with the autism community which I think is very, very important and increasingly important. Um, and yeah, so it's, that's been going now for about five or six years, uh, and it's absolutely fantastic to be part of. In MIE, our focus is on, uh, or, uh, the autism research is among us, our focus is primarily on issues around inclusion and inclusive education. So myself and colleagues like Wendy Symes, who's now at Birmingham, Caroline Bond, Judith Hebron, uh, have done work looking at a range of issues, bullying, transition from primary to secondary school, uh, development of what's called a resource base. So uh, one of the things that Manchester City Council uh, did a few years ago was invest in uh, resource bases for autism and specific language impairments in mainstream schools. And so we were involved, Caroline and Judith were involved in an evaluation of that. And then the only other thing I wanted to point out to you, and this is not a plug, this is not an attempt to get you to buy anything. Uh, we published a book or a series of books for SAGE uh, called Autism and Education. That came out about three years ago. Um, it's, I'm definitely not recommending you buy it because it's a volume, uh, four volumes of collected articles. It's designed for libraries to buy, so it costs about $1,200. So I'm not suggesting for a second any of you buy that. However, if you're interested in, we wrote a chapter for each of the volumes, um, which is essentially new content. The rest is just collated articles. If you're interested in the four chapters that we wrote, drop me an email or message me on Twitter and I'll just send you the word versions of those chapters okay as long as you don't tell sage who published them then we'll just keep it our secret okay so i'm going to talk to you about what autism spectrum conditions are what we know by the term bullying what we know about the bullying of children and people on the autism spectrum and then as i said really importantly what there is that we can do to prevent bullying among this particular group so the traditional kind of approach to talking about autism is focused on this idea of the triad of impairments. So social communication, social interaction, and social imagination. Um, autism's a lifelong condition. Um, it's not something that one grows out of. It's, it's something that is with and part of the person uh, for their lifetime. Um, and I think the, the autism society's definition actually is a really powerful one because the key thing in that, in that phrase that I've included there is it affects how people make sense of the world around them. So it's about differences in interpreting uh, information in the world around us. Um, but we focused for too long on the triad of impairments or the core difficulties. Um, the nature of autism means that it often brings with it areas of considerable strength. So things like memory, persistence, attention to detail, adherence to routine. And it's really important as a starting point to think about what autism brings in terms of strengths for young people as well as the difficulties that they experience. We can dwell too much on the difficulties, I think. Um, the other thing that's really important is it is a spectrum. So it, it affects people in different ways um, and you know, different levels of difficulty and strength. Uh, and that it's also a condition, it's not a disorder. I don't like the use of the word disorder in relation to autism, partly because it's not true, because people I know who are on the autism spectrum are among the most orderly that I've ever met. Um, but also I think it's, it kind of, it creates a, a deficit view. Condition I think is more appropriate. Condition is a way of being, and that's not value laden. It's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a way of being. Um, you'll have heard terms used Asperger syndrome, pervasive developmental disorder, all these other kind of labels that are applied. Um, but the latest diagnostic framework, the DSM-5, effectively eliminated all those now and they talk about autism spectrum disorder or autism spectrum condition. So I wanted to start really just by thinking about why the school environment might be a challenging place for somebody who has 
the pattern of strength and difficulties that we associate with, with autism. Um, and this comes from work that I've done with um, my colleague Gareth Morwood, who I'll say a little bit more about later on, uh, and Wendy Symes, who was a researcher and a PhD student of mine. Um, school can be a challenging place for children and young people on the autism spectrum, firstly because they're learning in a social setting and having to read social situations and decipher unwritten rules, which people who are not affected by autism effectively take for granted. So it's a much more kind of complex task to engage in that kind of social learning environment if you find uh, the kind of hidden social rules more difficult to decipher. Uh, learning also, especially in secondary school or in high school, you know, is typically in a very complex language environment and often with limited visual support. Uh, communicating with other pupils and adults could be challenging. Coping with change and transition is again something that for some people on the autism spectrum is a particular challenge. Uh, and just things like day-to-day -day organization uh, and generalizing learning beyond the classroom setting, beyond the setting in which it takes place. So it can be a challenge for children and young people who are affected by autism, but it can also be a challenge for adults who support them, for staff and parents. So things like gaining and maintaining and refocusing attention. One of the things that I've observed, some of the best educators that I've seen again, use some of the strengths we associate with autism. You know, some young people on the autism spectrum have particular interests uh, which they're highly motivated by. So simple things around integrating those interests into their teaching so that they know that they're going to have the young person's attention. So really quite simple things like that that can make a huge difference. Staff might also struggle to differentiate language or the curriculum. You know, it's very easy for us to talk in metaphors and to talk in very abstract terms, but that actually might actively disadvantage somebody who's affected by autism. Um, and it can also be a challenge sometimes to manage behaviour, you know, particularly for, for children and young people who are more affected by the, the kind of the more, what, what used to be called Canner's autism, the more kind of severe end of the autism spectrum. With it comes quite often challenging behaviour because that's a form of communication. And so managing that behaviour in the classroom setting can be a challenge. And it can also be a challenging place for the peer group, for the kids around those who are affected by autism. They may not understand why the young person thinks and behaves and relates to them in the way that they do. I'm going to come back to peer understanding a little bit later on. They may resent the extra attention that the child gets, because quite often there'll be additional adult support in the classroom, for example. Um, and a whole range of other things. They, they, they may find it equally challenging to work productively with a, a child or a young person on the autism spectrum. So school can be a challenging place. Okay, so what do we mean by bullying? Hopefully none of what I'm going to tell you over the next few minutes is new. You're here for a, a two-day bullying event, so I'm assuming you have some kind of interest in bullying and victimisation or preventing bullying and victimisation. But just by a brief reminder, so for behaviour to be classed as bullying, there are three key features. Um, the first is it's an abuse or an imbalance of power. So you have a perpetrator who has more power and a, a victim of bullying who has less power. So it's the, the perpetrator of bullying abusing that power relationship. Uh, it's also about intention. So the behaviour is intended to cause harm, whether that's physical harm or emotional harm to the, to the individual. And it's also repeated over time. So a one-off incident is not bullying, but if it's repeated over time, then it can become bullying. I think the only exception to that is when we talk about uh, certain aspects of cyberbullying, where it may only be once that somebody shares an inappropriate image of another person, but actually then the repetition is that that goes out to many, many, many people. Um, and we talk about essentially three different types of bullying. So we have direct bullying, which would be uh, name calling, physical attacks, those kinds of that very overt type of bullying. Uh, relational bullying, which is a lot harder to detect and is quite often gendered. So the evidence suggests that girls engage in relational bullying more so than boys, but that kind of subtle excluding the, the victim from social activities and things like that, that kind of, it's not as overt as the name calling and the kicking, but it's nonetheless harmful. And then finally, with the advent of kind of digital technology and the internet, this notion of cyberbullying, bullying that takes place over social media or over some form of digital communication. 
One thing to say on that, which I think is worth repeating briefly, just to be clear on what the evidence suggests, is, well, two things, actually. One is that, actually, cyberbullying is not on the increase. So we do some work with uh, Dan Alwais, who people, I'm sure, will have heard of, who's the kind of one of the world leaders in bullying research. And Dan Alvius' research, which goes back pretty much since the advent of the internet, shows cyberbullying is not escalating into some major crisis. It's not to say that it's not massively harmful to the young people that are affected, but it's not something that's massively increasing. And the other thing is, is it's not creating, for the most part, it's not creating new victims. So most of the children, about 90% of children and young people who are cyberbullied, are also bullied relationally or directly as well. So it's not really created many new victims. What it's done is it's created a new method through which existing victims can be further victimised. And as was said earlier, it breaks that barrier. So when the young person goes home, and that might normally be a sanctuary, that barrier has now been broken down because they're connected to the internet through social media and so on. In terms of prevalence, I always really struggle with this question of what's the number? What's the magic number that tells us what proportion of children and young people are affected by bullying? It varies massively. So it depends which country you're in. Australia, England, Finland, America, Sweden, Spain. Uh, it varies massively by age. So there is a peak around the period of kind of the end of childhood and start of adolescence, but then it starts to wane off again. So by the time kids are at the end of high school, bullying is actually quite exceptionally rare compared to the early years of high school. Um, Depends who you ask in terms of informant. If you ask, ch ask children and young people, you get one response. If you ask parents, teachers, you get different prevalence estimates. And also the time frame. Were you bullied in the last week, in the last day, in the last month, in the last year, in the last term, and so on? So all these things make it really difficult. That said, I found a meta-analysis that was published uh, three or four years ago that suggested 35%. So if you're desperate to have a figure, 35% is that figure. But like I said, take it with a pinch of salt because of all those factors. And it's a major priority. It's obviously a major priority for you here in New South Wales and in Australia, but it's also, that's reflected internationally. Uh, and in England, just by way of example, every school in England has to demonstrate evidence of their actions to prevent bullying when they're inspected. So we have a school inspectorate called Ofsted, uh, and under what's called personal development and behaviour and welfare, that strand of school inspection, schools have to evidence that they have a clear, explicit policy that shows how they uh, act to prevent bullying. Uh, and it can damage their inspection grade if they're not able to evidence that. So in terms of what influences bullying, so Dorothy Espelage, who's here today uh, and is one of the major uh, researchers in this area, talks about this idea of a social ecological model. So if you want to understand what's underpinning bullying, we need to look at what's going on in the classroom, what's going on in the school, what's going on in the community and in broader society, and think about the norms and values and the behaviours and attitudes that are modelled for children and young people. Um, we also know from research uh, that we can predict, with a reasonable degree of accuracy, children that are more likely to be bullied uh, based on certain characteristics. And one of those characteristics is about their uh, social status within the, the peer group. And this is one of the key things for children on the autism spectrum. Children that are more isolated socially and have fewer friendship networks are at an increased risk of experiencing bullying. And then finally, we have this um, distinction between obviously bullies and victims, but also bully victims, children who at once are victims of bullying but also perpetrate bullying. Um, and there is some evidence to suggest that some children and young people on the autism spectrum may fit into that category as well because they are responding like with like effectively. Um, in terms of outcomes of bullying, uh, I won't spend too long on this, but... Uh, my colleague Tanya Larea, who is uh, at the Anna Freud Centre in London that we do a lot of work with, did a major analysis um, a few years back looking at what the research tells us about the lifelong outcomes of bullying. And I think that's the key message, is that the effects of bullying don't end when the bullying stops. They don't end when the young person finishes school. The evidence suggests that right into adulthood, we can track the negative effects of bullying. So the studies that show effects of bullying, people that have been bullied in childhood well into their 50s, the, the, the biggest longitudinal studies with people that are now in their 50s that show uh, these additional maladaptive outcomes. So the consequences of bullying last a lifetime and that's one of the key reasons we need to think about what, what more that we can do in those early years during school uh, to prevent these negative effects. <coughs> 
So, what about bullying of children and young people on the autism spectrum? So, Schroeder and colleagues um, talk about this idea of children and young people on the autism spectrum being, in quotes, perfect victims, and said they may be particularly vulnerable to involvement in bullying. So, wanted to think about, well, why might that be the case? What is it about the nature of uh, autism spectrum that might predispose children to be more likely to be bullied? Uh, and we did some work, this came out about seven years ago, this is what we call the reciprocal effects peer interaction model, and it was just a way of thinking about how children affected by autism um, interact with uh, their peer group uh, and how the nature and quality of those interactions might actually predispose them. So there, it's effectively kind of two routes to bullying. On the one hand, we know we've got children and young people who have difficulties with social cognition. They may have problems with social and communicative, uh, communicative skills. So that might make productive social interaction uh, in, a, in an unsupported environment, so like in the playground, for example, more difficult. But equally, at the peer group level, we know from the research that there's a general lack of awareness and understanding of autism among neurotypical children. So it's not just a problem that resides within the, the young person who's affected by autism, it's, a, it's equally a problem in the peer group. And so because of that lack of awareness and understanding, the peer group may be less motivated to engage in positive social interactions. So we predicted in this the study that we did uh, that there would be reduced quality and frequency of peer interactions. When that quality and frequency is reduced, children have more limited social networks, fewer friends, less social support. So the nature of that interaction means that children are becoming more isolated. And we know from research that children that are more isolated in the kind of social hierarchy of school are the ones who are much more likely to be bullied. So we predicted we'd see increased rates of bullying and social rejection, increased isolation and loneliness as a result, and then these kind of feedback loops that you get. So with the peer group, because of all this going on, the peer group aren't having opportunities to learn about autism because they're engaging in these negative behaviours towards them. And equally then, there's reduced motivation for social contact among children affected by autism. So you've got these kind of double feedback loops that perpetuate the situation. So we did a study um, about eight years ago to look at this. And one of the things that we were particularly interested in was in terms of frequency of bullying, um, was there something specific about autism or was it just children with disabilities more generally? Because a lot of the issues to do with social isolation and distance, you might equally apply to children with other disabilities. So we did a study where we had children on the autism spectrum, uh, children in this case uh, with dyslexia, so with a disability that wasn't autism, uh, and then children who had no identified disability. And obviously you can see the, the rate of children uh, being bullied with autism was uh, much higher than both of those other groups. So we know there's something quite specific about autism spectrum conditions uh, where we see high rates of bullying. One of the key things to say with uh, the instrument that we used here, whose the name of the instrument has escaped me, but it's in the, the paper, is we were very careful to choose an instrument that didn't include the word bullying because we'd had anecdotal evidence and some evidence in the literature um, about misinterpretation of the word bullying. So the, the questionnaire that we used was purely about behaviours that we know to be bullying. So has another child called you names? Has another child kicked you? Has another child da da da? So that we were avoiding uh, misrepresenting prevalence rates because of misunderstanding of the term. Uh, this is a study from the States looking at kind of the same thing. So they had uh, children on the autism spectrum children with other uh, with learning disabilities and ADHD, and then typically developing children. And what's interesting about this particular study by Cleuston and colleagues is they split out the different types of bullying uh, and different types of kind of victimization. And again, they show, as you can see with the, the black bars, which are the children on the autism spectrum, for most of these types of bullying, uh, higher rates than either the children with other disabilities or children with no identified disabilities. So the, the convergence of evidence is such that we know that there are higher rates. Um, so how many children and young people on the autism spectrum are bullied? What's the prevalence rate? Uh, again, pick your number. So the lowest estimate I've been able to find was 7%, and I was, wow, well, that's actually a lot lower than the kind of average. But then... For every study that suggests low, there are probably three or four studies that suggest a much higher rate. So 94%, which was a, a parent reported one, and as I said, depending on who you ask, you get different rates. Parents tend to report higher rates, I think, particularly 
among children and young people on the autism spectrum, the work we've done with parents suggests that it's the parents that they will unfold all this onto when they get home from school. So the kids are kind of bottling this up throughout the day and they get home and just, uh, and it all comes out. Uh, and so parents tend to hear a lot more about it and that amplifies the, their reporting. Um, so parents re reliably report higher rates than teachers. As a meta-analysis came out a couple of years ago, uh, which suggested anywhere between, depending on the, the type uh, of bullying, uh, anywhere between about 30% and 50%. But generally speaking, you know, same sources of variation as we see with the, the kind of general uh, bullying literature, but usually much higher than typically developing peers, and that's certainly what we found in the studies that we've done. But not every child on the autism spectrum is going to be bullied. And so some of the research that we've done and others have done has looked at risk factors. And this is essentially a kind of a summary of um, the most commonly identified ones. So it peaks around age 13, um, which is pretty similar to the kind of peak. It's a little bit delayed, but it's pretty similar to the peak of bullying in the typically developing population, but it's that little bit older. Um, boys rather than girls, so girls on the autism spectrum are less likely to be bullied than, than boys on the autism spectrum. Kids who have the label Asperger syndrome or the kids who are effectively the milder forms of autism uh, are much more likely to be bullied than the children with the more kind of severe complex forms of autism. Uh, children whose kind of social cognition profile shows that kind of vulnerability. So the example is uh, the kids whose difficulties in social understanding but motivation to be part of a social group puts them at risk of getting tricked into things. So we had uh, one young man that we worked with uh, in one of the schools where we we're doing research who was forever uh, getting tricked into doing things by the peer group. That was their way of bullying him. He didn't actually know. He, he didn't know, in inverted commas, he was being bullied. But when you observe what was going on, they would do things like they'd, they'd trick him into asking out the most attractive girl in the class, saying, oh, she likes you, she likes you. All, all you need to do is go and ask her out. And, of course, he would go and ask her out, and she would... What? No, I don't. I don't like you. Know, and you know, and then all the kids are falling about laughing at you know having tricked him into doing things like that. So the kids that have got that kind of social vulnerability combined with that motivation to try and be part of the social group, uh, that means they're more likely to get tricked into doing things. Kids who attend mainstream school as opposed to specialist education. Um, immediately, I want to caveat that and say that does not mean that kids with autism spectrum conditions are better off in specialist education. What it means is we don't get it right in mainstream education. Um, kids who have uh, behaviour difficulties, uh, in addition to their autism, we found in our study, we had data, uh, we did a study of about 800 kids um, uh, on the autism spectrum, and we had data from our National Pupil Database that was about how they got to school, uh, and we found the kids who used public transport to get to school as opposed to walking or being taken by their parents were much more likely to be bullied kind of puzzled by that but then when you think about what that provides so public transport so the kids get in the bus or the train it's a unsupervised environment packed with kids in a small space it's the perfect environment for bullying to take place little if any adult supervision there you know the bus driver's just concentrating on getting the bus to the school and so it's a kind of it's a breeding ground for for bullying and then uh, what we used to call in in england school action plus so this is just to, by way of explanation this is um the kind of middle ground between um, early identification of special educational needs and what we call a statement or an education care and health plan. So again, these are the kids whose needs are complex enough that they've been identified and there is some support, but not so complex that they are undergoing formal assessment for an education care and health plan. So again, it's the kids with the more mild difficulties that are more likely to be bullied. Uh, this, again, just reinforces that issue around mainstream versus special. Um, so these are kids, they've split it with uh, the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, and the kids with a high ADOS score, so a high ADOS score is basically greater social difficulties, uh, doesn't matter um, from mainstream to special, the bullying rate is the same, but the kids with a low ADOS social, the kids with more mild social difficulties, the bullying rates are much higher in mainstream than they are in a special school or in a resourced unit. Um, and then we also know from research we published last year that these risk factors that I spoke about, so let me just go back, these risk factors that I spoke about, children aren't just affected by one of them. Many of these risk factors cluster together. And so we did a study looking at cumulative risk. And what you can see across the bottom here 
is uh, the number of risks which a child's exposed to. So if, are they a boy? Do they have the label of Asperger's? Are they school action plus? And so on and so forth. Um, so this is their cumulative risk score. This is the bullying score. And both parent and teacher report, we see this uh, exponential increase in bullying as the number of risk factors increases. So these children who are exposed to five different of those risks that I mentioned have the highest rates of bullying. And it's not, the key thing is it's not a linear relationship, so it's not a straight line. It gets exponentially worse the more risks a young person's exposed to. Um, what we know from speaking to children and young people, so I've done a lot of work um, with speaking to adolescents who are affected by autism. So our, our ESRC study that was on inclusive education, the primary focus was actually giving those young people a voice uh, and we interviewed many children and young people, but we also, some were, um, some didn't want to be interviewed because it would be anxiety provoking for them. So we said, well, is there another way in which you could tell us about your experience of school um, that might help us understand what it's like for you? So some of the young people uh, drew pictures for us. This is one which I think is fairly self-explanatory. So this is the young person uh, who's drawn themselves and this is essentially their peer group uh, victimised, and we said, well, just draw us a picture then of what life is like in school for you. So this is, you know, quite disturbing for a young person. This is a young person that was about 13 or 14 at the time. That's this is the representation of their life in school. And this is that same young person uh, who drew us another picture that's been annotated by um, this young man's uh, teaching assistant because it's not immediately obvious what's going on. But basically, so we blanked out his name. Uh, he's killed by a bomb. The angels are sad to get him, and the pupils have a party because he's dead. So this is, you know, really quite for a 13, 14 year old boy to be presenting us with this when we say, "What's life like in school for you?" Uh, it's really quite, you know, really quite powerful um, representation. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip over. Um, some of the outcomes we know from research, uh, schoolwork definitely suffers, mental health difficulties. We did a study, uh, Humphrey and Heber on this one here, looking at anxiety and depression in children and young people on the autism spectrum. Massively increased prevalence rates compared to typically developing uh, young people. And when we did follow-up interviews with those young people, bullying came out as the number one trigger for anxiety and depression in this population. So what can we do? The first thing that we can do, I think, is to think about what we know from the general bullying intervention research. So there is a lot of research that's been carried out on bullying prevention more generally, not specifically in relation to autism. And we know from um, Jimenez Barbero's meta-analysis and many other meta-analyses where they've pulled together data from multiple studies, um, bullying intervention programs can work. Uh, they need to be comprehensive, so it's not just about the bully and the victim. It's also about the bystanders, the other kids in the social group who are not necessarily engaging in the bullying, but they are, you know, they're seeing it happen uh, and promoting the idea of this lovely phrase that I learned last week, uh, taking children from being bystanders to upstanders. So actually making the, the peer group more of a source of support. Other members of the school community, family, broader community, so reinforcing some of those messages from... Uh, Wendy this morning that this is not just an issue of bullies and victims it's much broader than that so things that we can do at the level of the child um, one of the key things that we can do is help the young people understand the nature of bullying first of all to prevent over or under reporting so I mentioned the young man earlier who didn't actually know who was being bullied he was just engaging uh, with his peers but he was being exploited but you also get young people who, because of the nature of their social cognition difficulties, will report being bullied when they're not being bullied. So we had one young person that we worked with uh, in our ESRC study um, who was constantly reporting to the teacher uh, that he was being bullied because some of the children who sat behind him used to chew gum. Now, they had no clue, genuinely no clue, that this chewing gum was, was a problem for him. He could hear them chewing and he was hypersensitive to it. He also had a real problem with the fact that it was against school rules because, again, he was very rule-based. So he couldn't... And But he was... To him, then, he was saying, this is bullying. And so kind of talking through and, and raising awareness of bullying, developing understanding of social cues to try and prevent that social vulnerability thing, so to prevent young people being exploited. Um, 
role-playing bullying situations, using things like social stories. If you work with children and young people on the autism spectrum, I'm sure you'll have heard of social stories. Social stories are ideal, uh, an ideal structured approach to teaching about bullying. Um, and then also teaching some generic prevention strategies. So bullying tends to happen, we found, with the kids that we interviewed uh, when they were on their own. So actually making sure that the young person uh, is, you know, things like safety in numbers, it's less likely to happen if you're with somebody else. And so getting kids to pair up and buddy up and so on. And also giving kids a, a refuge within the school, somewhere where they can go and feel safe. Because otherwise school can be a very, very stressful environment. It's already a very stressful environment for young people on the autism spectrum. Um, Hong and colleagues provide a kind of a stepped approach. I won't go into it in too much detail now because of the time, but basically if anybody wants this, drop me an email and I can send you the paper. This was specifically about working through with the young people uh, what's kind of triggering the bullying, what, what's happening before the bullying incidents occur, working through what happens when the bullying happens and what the consequences are, and introducing strategies uh, to try and avoid it or to, to, to try and prevent its effects. So the Hong paper, like I said, I'll send to people. Uh, I think it's a really good resource and a really practical resource if you're thinking about what you could implement in your school. So it's not just about the, the child or the young person. There's definitely a lot of work to be done in relation to the peer group. And in fact, this is probably the place that I would start, actually, because it's the peer group kind of, the, you know, needs, I think, the most work in terms of awareness and understanding. Um, to give you an illustration of that, there's a fantastic study, a really simple study, but a really powerful one, Campbell and colleagues, about 14 years ago. Uh, they did this little experiment with um, neurotypical kids, so kids who wouldn't be the, the, the peer group, uh, and they did two things. So they had a little experiment, and the kids were put into one of two groups. In one group, they just showed them a video of um, a young person uh, that had been developed by an autism charity to illustrate the kinds of behaviours we associate with autism. Uh, and then they surveyed them and they said, how likely would you be to play with this child? How likely would you be to invite them out for tea? How li likely would you be to work with them at school? And so on. And then in the other group, they did the same, but they, in addition to the video showing the, the kind of behaviour, they added explanatory information. So they essentially narrated the video and said, this is John. John has autism. Autism affects the way that we make sense of the world around us. These are some of the difficulties children with autism have. These are some of the strengths and so on. So they basically, it was about awareness raising and about providing an explanation for the behavior that the kids were seeing. And again, they gave them the same survey. How likely would you be to play with them, you know, uh, work with them in school and so on and so forth. And what they found with the kids that had been given that explanatory information, they were much more likely to rate positively all of those things that they surveyed. So a really simple thing of raising awareness and educating the peer group about the nature of autism that demystifies it, that helps them to understand this person thinks and behaves in ways that are different to that, that I'm used to, but there is an explanation for it. And where there's an explanation for it, children are immediately much more empathic. So simple things like that can be really powerful. It doesn't have to be done in a way that singles out the children. So it doesn't have to be, this is John in your class. It can just be about autism more generally. And then the kids will join the dots. They, they don't need the kids pointing out to them because obviously that could be, that could be quite damaging. Um, also, there's work to do at the level of teachers and support staff. So... The research from Canada shows the quality of teacher-pupil interactions and relationships. So how the class teacher behaves in relation to the young person on the autism spectrum essentially sets an example for the rest of the class. So they look and see, well, how does the teacher relate to this, this child? And they use that as a model for their own behavior. One thing we saw uh, in one of our studies was you essentially had kind of two types of teachers. Most of the kids that we were working with had some kind of teaching assistant support. They were all had, at the time, what were called statements and are now called education, health and care plans. So they were typically supported for most of the school day by a teaching assistant, teacher's aide. But the teachers of those classes essentially behaved in one of two ways. One type of teacher effectively had little or no interaction with the young person, because effectively then it was that teaching assistant's job to support that child. The other teachers actually worked in a very different way, and the teaching assistant was deployed more as a resource to be used as necessary, and the teachers in those classes 
interacted with the young person just as much as they did with the, the other peers. And then the teaching assistant is there as a support when needed. So part of it is about how uh, those teaching assistants are deployed. Um, the things that young people and their parents, so the SCUTO study that I've got up there, these are what they say, uh, young people and parents, this is what will make a difference from their perspective. Empathy and respect, thinking about individual needs, what works for one young person won't necessarily work for all kids on the autism spectrum. So it's taking the time to get to know that child and gathering information from parents. Uh, and tolerance and acceptance. So this, I'll talk about whole school things in a second, but this encouragement of viewing diversity as a very positive, powerful thing uh, that we can use as a learning tool. So rather than diversity as being a way of kind of dividing children, um, thinking about ways in which we can celebrate diversity. And autism is just another way of being different in the same way that children look different, have different musical tastes, have you know different religions. It's just we're different in very many ways. And if we encourage children and young people to view autism as a difference as opposed to a deficit, that can be a really powerful change agent. So at the level of school culture, as I said, that idea of respecting diversity and different, don't hide from it. Don't try and sweep it under the carpet, actively celebrating diversity and difference. Staff have to model these values. So it's, it's, you know, if we expect children to behave in empathic ways towards our more vulnerable learners, the adults have got to be doing the same. The adults are kind of modeling behavior uh, for the children. We also have to challenge stereotypes and raise expectations. So there is still, even now that autism is very, you know, much better understood than it was even 10 or 20 years ago, there is still a bit of a stereotype that exists. So when people think about autism, you know, if they've not had the kind of training in professional development, they think Rain Man, they think these kind of stereotypical images, and that immediately sets a bar uh, in terms of expectation. So we need to challenge those stereotypes. Uh, and maintaining a really positive goal-oriented focus. So we've done a number of uh, papers on this idea of what we call mainstreaming autism. So changing the mainstream environment so that it is much more autism friendly and it begins with that idea of kind of culture and climate. So I mentioned um, my colleague Gareth Morwood. So my other recommendation in terms of uh, things to go and kind of seek out, um, Gareth uh, we've worked with for many years and whenever I speak about autism I always mention him. One, because if there was a Gareth Morwood in every school in our country, we would have a much better education system. What Gareth is, is an agent of change. Um, he's the special education and inclusion coordinator at a school in Stockport in Manchester, um, and is very passionate about the needs of all kids with disabilities, but particularly kids on the autism spectrum. And so he's developed this model, which Wendy and I uh, worked with him on, about what, in, in schools where things work well, and in some schools things work extremely well, that's not to say that there aren't still issues for some young people, but you know, some schools where things work extremely well. Where those schools are, these things tend to be in place. So they have an agent of change who drives progress forward. They have uh, flexible provision. So the school that I mentioned, uh, for some children and young people, at certain points in the year, it might actually be more appropriate for them to have some respite, and they, you know, they have an arrangement with... Uh, one of the local specialist schools where they can go and spend a couple of days a week if things are getting very difficult in the mainstream environment. Or within the mainstream environment, if they're struggling with particular lessons because the social and the cognitive load is too high, they might actually have some withdrawal work. So it's about that being as flexible as possible, even if that means that actually the young person is uh, kind of co-enrolled at a special school. That's, you know, that kind of flexibility needs to be in place so that we can cater for young people's needs. Um, there needs to be policy development, and that needs to be embedded in practice. It's no good having a policy that just sits there on a website or sits there in a, in a file cabinet. It's got to be enacted. It's got to be practical. It's got to be concrete. Staff need constant training and development. So even if they've done continuing professional development on autism, and most teachers have had a little bit on it in their pre-service training, and they might have done a little bit more on it, the idea is this is constantly needs to be updated with concrete examples from young people as well. Um, peer education and awareness I already talked about, but having that change agent uh, right in the centre of the action is really crucial. So you need somebody in the school 
if that's you, fantastic, or if it's a colleague, but somebody who's going to drive change forward because without that person who's relentless and full of energy and enthusiasm, it's difficult to change. I mean, secondary schools, particularly these huge organisations are like ocean liners. They can take a long time to turn around. So if you've got somebody really passionate at the helm, that's going to be a much easier journey. So as I said, I recommend you look my colleague and friend Gareth Morwood up Find him on Twitter, harass him on Twitter, in a very friendly way, harass him on Twitter because he will provide multiple resources. He has a website as well, which is all completely free resources that he, as an expert practitioner over the last decade, 15 years, has been collating and collecting and curating. And it's all there sitting ready to be downloaded, not just around issues of bullying, but around issues of inclusion more generally for children and young people on the autism spectrum. Uh, and then very quickly to end with, because I'm bang out of time now, this for me is the bottom line. So I don't want to scaremonger. Definitely don't want to do that. But this is the reality for some children and young people. These are uh, examples that I found from uh, different media outlets across the world where you've children and young people whose lives have become so desperate because of the bullying that, that, and the social isolation that they've experienced that they have opted to take their own lives. Now, this isn't hundreds of children and young people by any stretch of the imagination but the fact that there is enough across you know one or two children is too many so this is something that we need to address as early as possible and with as much energy and passion and enthusiasm as possible i quite happily send i think i've actually already sent to, to trin uh copies of some of our papers that might be useful if people are interested in further reading and with that i'll shut up Thank you. And just to remind everybody that all of the videos, all of the slides that are used in the conference will be available. We sent out the details so you absolutely have access to all of this fabulous content. Um, I've been going through the Slido questions. We've had some very interesting questions come through, but I think what really resonated Okay. Uh, so we've had some interesting questions around what might be the, the elements of autism that may actually result in a young person engaging in bullying behaviour and how do we support them to change their behaviours? Okay. So um, as I said during the, the presentation, there is some evidence to suggest that ch some children on the spectrum can be at once bullies and victims of bullying. And I think part of that comes from some of the difficulties in social understanding uh, that uh, young people on the autism spectrum experience and not necessarily knowing, you know, so the, 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 the behaviour that is just essentially a reaction to what's been modelled for them. So this has happened to me and therefore, you know, that's what I do as my response. And I think that's a, that's a really kind of rational response um, for a young person to take if they've not got that kind of word in their ear around well actually you know this is actually you know this is something that might be hurtful to the other person so it's it's kind of a way i suppose of thinking about well what can we do to uh help the young people who engage who are bullied but also engage in bullying think about that other person's perspective and that might not be an automatic position for somebody on autism, uh, autism spectrum because of the difficulties in social understanding so actually talking through well you know, when this happened to you, what did this feel like? And kind of putting it into their own perspective so that they can then empathise with others. And I think that's true of the general bullying literature as well, where you've got bully victims. It's about promoting empathy and giving the children an alternative reaction, an alternative way of responding that isn't just passing the bullying on. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So I think the key thing here is around making use of the peer group. So, you know, a really simple thing to say, but one that could never really be enacted is to say, right, we'll have adult anti-bullying supervisors at every bus stop. Of course, that's never going to happen. We couldn't resource it, and it probably wouldn't work anyway. So this is one of those situations where we really need to mobilize the peer group who are going to be there when the bullying takes place. You know, bullying happens, other kids see it happening, and they'll be there at the bus stop, they'll be there on the bus. And I think this is where the peer group can play a really important role and taking those young people who have previously been bystanders to the bullying and encouraging them to be upstanding in their behavior and, and making sure that they challenge it when it happens, making sure that if they then, you know, even if they don't feel comfortable challenging it, that they report it. Because we also know children and young people on the autism spectrum may be less likely, some of them, to actually report the bullying when it happens. We interview children and young people um, and it wasn't because they didn't necessarily understand that they'd been bullied. Those that did said they didn't report it to teachers because they'd done it in the past and nothing had happened. So this is one where I think mobilising the peer group is really important. Well, the transition to high school is, you know, pretty much the major, I think, the major transition that all children and young people will experience between, you know, well, the, there's the transition to school in the first place, and then there's a transition to being an adult, but in the middle, this is this major, major change. And what we know from speaking to young people and their parents is they do find this very difficult, it's challenging, not just because it's a change in the routines, but also because the social structure that they're used to with the peer group shifts immediately as well. So they go from being, you know, primary schools tend to be, you know, much smaller, much less complex social environments than high schools. So there's all of these changes in addition to changing the school. So, you know, we deal with this and we support young people in the same way that we would support them through other transitions. It's about making the unexpected expected. Because that's what provokes the anxiety. In, in terms of changes in routine, what provokes anxiety among the young people on the autism spectrum is I like things to be predictable, I like them to be you know, expected, and this is now unexpected and this is different. And so we make the unexpected expected, we talk them through uh, what secondary school is going to be like, we talk them through uh, even things like navigating the, phys uh, the physical environment. So one secondary school we'd worked with not specifically for kids on the autism spectrum, but they did things like virtual tours. So they'd actually created through some software a way of they could click through so the young people could actually see on the computer screen without even before they'd even visited the school what the layout of the school was, how to get around it. We can use mentoring systems to make sure that children and young people have an immediate social connection when they arrive in secondary school. So lots of mentoring systems in the UK, you know, they'll use the pro-social older peers to essentially keep an eye out for the more vulnerable kids to make sure that they settle in. Uh, and then the key thing is also making the unexpected expected for the staff. So passing all that valuable information on from the primary school setting to the secondary school setting because in terms of special education support, that's where I think a lot of it breaks down. The transition for children and young people with disabilities more generally can be more difficult because a lot of the valuable information that's been learned about their needs in primary school takes too long to find its way to the secondary setting. So quite often for the first year of secondary school, children with autism and other disabilities it's effectively like a blank slate almost in some schools and so making sure that information gets through. Um, the, one of the schools that we work with uses uh, little passports that they pass on and that goes from primary school to secondary school, not an actual passport obviously, but the idea of the passport with key information about the child, but then that's added to and it goes to every single class teacher. Because the other thing that changes of course in high school is the kids go from, in England, they go from having one teacher for pretty much everything to having 11, 12, 13 different teachers. There's not as close a relationship. The teachers don't have as much time to build up a rapport and understand needs. So passing that information on through this kind of passport system or other thing like that can be really powerful.
Yeah, yeah, very much so. I think that's a really important question and you know you could see it going either way you could see well is the best thing to do to to not pull the rug effectively and, and let them know uh, or is it better to be completely open and honest and I think the for me the the going with the route even if it's even if it's going to be difficult for the young person they deserve to know in the way that we would all I'm sure hope to be informed that what we thought was a healthy social relationship actually we were being exploited I would want to know and so I think you know even though it was going to be difficult for the for the child or young person um, they need to be supported through that experience but absolutely they need to be told that this is going on and worked with them to think about well how can we avoid how can I pick up on cues that somebody's actually leading me astray kind of thing. Um, I don't know specifically of any research, but anecdotally, what I would say is most of the schools that we've worked in in our autism studies are the mainstream schools. Um, they typically, particularly if they have a resource base within the school for autism and communication, there are higher than usual uh, numbers of children on the autism spectrum because they've got a resource base, so they, they, they're able to accommodate more children on the spectrum. Um, and they will typically, because that's a safe haven, they'll typically kind of use that as a base and they'll get to know other children on the spectrum. Whether that makes them more resilient, less resilient, I honestly don't know the answer to, but I do know that the schools that we've worked with where there is that kind of safe haven, uh, the children really value it and they, and they find school a, a more tolerable experience as a result. Um, open communication. I mean, this is a challenging one because schools generally, certainly schools that we've worked with, um, bullying is such a loaded term. It's such an emotive term that irrespective of a child being on the spectrum, when parents report bullying to the school, a natural reaction can be, doesn't happen here you know we schools don't want to think that that kind of behavior happens what we always say is if you've got more than two kids in a room you're going to get some but you know it's just it's it's a social phenomenon so the first thing is acknowledging that yes it's going to have taken place and respecting the the respecting what the parents bring to the situation so if parent is so concerned that they've come to the school uh, even if teachers haven't observed it i think assuming that the parent is not exaggerating and assuming that the parent is not kind of over egging it just actually responding and saying right we you know we'll find out more doing some investigation and you know rather than kind of putting up the defenses and saying no we've not seen it so it's not happening you know just working from the starting point that the the parent is getting this information on a daily basis from their young person so if they felt strongly enough to come to the school with it kind of respecting that position even if what the teacher sees is something quite different. A lot of the bullying that happens, happens out of sight of the teacher. So it's not surprising actually that parents report more and children report more than teachers because if it was happening in sight of the teacher, one would hope the teacher does something about it. Nice plug. <laughs> <laughs>
and everybody find Gareth Morwood and email him. He'll be delighted to have 200 Australians asking him for advice.